Welcome, everybody. It is the 11th of October. I'm here with Ian Graham, Oroka's president, Andrew Ware, our chief consultant geologist and qualified person for the second in a series of videos that we're doing explaining the recently published PE. This one is part two, resource, definition, and upside. And before I yield the floor to Ian and Andrew, I'll just talk about some recent changes to our presentation deck that's on our website as well as some of the latest information coming from Mexico. As usual, there will be some forward-looking statements. And uh, the PEA, you've all had a chance to review the PEA. Big improvements, obviously, today with copper at 440. We've seen, we've seen a jump in the effective value of Senate to Mass, the net asset value. As talked about in a previous video, there's a tremendous amount of leverage there. But this is a slide that doesn't relate to that, but it's, it's one that's been recently added to the deck. Because I think the information in this, the, the predictions, the forecasts by the International Energy Agency are quite notable in the context of copper demand. The International Energy Agency has, has forecast an increase in renewable electrical generating capacity worldwide by 5,000 gigawatts over the next six or seven years. And to put that in context, that is 5,000 gigawatts versus, for instance, 1,300 gigawatts that's the entire electrical generating capacity of the USA today. So we're going to see an almost 4x increase or 4x increase in renewable energy generating capacity worldwide, 4x versus the entire United States. So that is copper intensive at its generation stage, copper intensive at its transmission stage, and copper intensive at the stage that it is being used by businesses and consumers. So Big number definitely supports a continuation of this trend, increased copper consumption. In this case, from 1900 to today, we're using 500,000 tons per annum in 1900, and we're currently at about 26 million tons, so an increase of 52 times. That forecast by the International Energy Commission would suggest that we're going to see continued increase in copper consumption. And of course, as this is very, very much what the copper thesis is, that are coming at a time of historically low pipeline of new projects to, to meet future demand and a rate of discovery and resource replacement that has just simply fallen off a cliff is in a three decade decline despite increased exploration expenses uh, expenditures. So very interesting time, huge increase in demand coming at a time of challenges to supply. In a nutshell, that's the cover thesis. Some other developments specific to us and other Mexico based projects, the president of Mexico, Claudia Scheinbaum, she was president-elect during the last video. Upon her inauguration last week, uh, published or republished a list of 100 pledges. The prior publication in July included mention of open pit mining legislation, banning new open pit mining concessions. The new 100 pledges published last week did not include that. And that is coinciding with some rhetoric from other members of the Mexican government, the new minister of the economy, for instance, which suggests that this administration is backing away from AMLO's anti-mining stance. They're doing so gently so far, but it's, it's very encouraging and it has the entire mining sector in Mexico very optimistic and you're seeing some responses to the market price of some listed companies. Now, there's also been some recent transactions that suggest support for Mexico, whether it's from the financial community or whether it's within mining company being manifested by mining company m and Big investment in Vizla Silver, um, a silver company, albeit an underground, a prospective underground project, but also based in Sinaloa, as we are. The acquisition by First Majestic of Gato Silver for almost a billion dollars, and then an acquisition uh, of Silvercrest by Core Mining for 1.7 billion. So some big endorsements of, of the jurisdiction. Uh, and with that, uh, I will hand it over to Ian and Andrew. Thanks, Adam. Just the, the slide in front of us really just introduces or reintroduces the district scale for the setting of Santo Tomas, which is just left of center, just slightly south of center of this view. We're looking to the north, northwest uh, across the, the project and the concessions held by Oroco are outlined in, in red. Santo Tomas is the porphyry star at the center. Moving to the right side of the screen, we begin looking at some of the major projects that have been held and, in, and operated by major companies previously. El Sosal, 
uh, a high sulfidation epithermal, almost certainly related to a deeply buried porphyry in that region. And then moving across to the two major porphyries at Santo Tomas and Baharachi. And that axis of mineralization is flanked by La Reforma and Santanita, a pair of SCARN CRD deposits that have been previously operated. Moving on to El Tempisqui, El Rosario, and the El Platano or Vanilla projects, all district mineralized systems, and there is some small scale superficial iron mining that has continued in the area just to the essentially just to the right of El Platano. So a, a district scale, we've got an elevation profile uh, in that in the image and some of the details of the projects and prior operators for contemplation. Andrew, perhaps you'd like to chat a little about your past experience in the area and uh, the companies that have operated there. Yeah, certainly. So one of the stars there, Al Capara, I was working with Kennecott Exploration in the last century, and uh, we drilled four or five holes there. There's an adit there that shows good copper, mi uh, copper mineralization within an adit, uh, which we sampled. So there's no shortage of big company interest in this area either. You look at Newmont, Goldcorp, uh, Jinchuan at Barawachi, uh, which was purchased from Tidal Resources, but also Peñoles, Tormex. It's a district, it's received a lot of attention and, and typically what happens in districts, you're never the first company, you know, the first company in there doesn't necessarily discover what you're looking for, but in this case, it's a district that has received significant attention and there's some big resources outlined, including Santa Tomas, obviously. Highly prospective, lots of really interesting intrusives to the south of us, breccia pipes, it's got all the right characteristics for a district where you'd want to be to find something big. Agreed. And I think recently on the blog, we posted some photographs of the project crew out east of Santo Tomas sampling in the drainages. And so we're beginning to take a bit of a, a broader view on what uh, is on our, our project and our concessions specifically. And it's appropriate, I think, to note that La Reforma, the former Peñoles mine there, is within our concessions control. Adam, yeah, this is an animated video and we'll point out a few things. To begin, if uh, you can focus as we rotate on the magenta colored geology, which is shown in outcrop, that is the intrusive quartz monzonite porphyry system that has driven the mineralization at Santo Tomas. And what developing before you are the pits for the current PEA mine plan the block model, and the drilling undertaken by Oroco. Andrew, you might like to address what's going on at South Zone. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting to, to look at that view there. You can see that the strip ratio is not particularly large. If you look at the South Zone, there's a, a zone that's highlighted by a couple of red blocks. That's associated with a drill hole S18, which had some of the best grades we've seen to date, and essentially open uh, to the south and the southwest. And this gives you a pretty good idea of what we're looking at in terms of the entire resource, which we aren't contemplating mining at the moment. I think we've got 250 million or 275 million tons of material that sits under the reservoir to the north. Again, that's a really interesting video. Uh, you can see the pit starting to appear again there. And essentially, as you move to the north or the right-hand side in this view, you can see that the pit stops at the, the reservoir. We have a, a Conagua limit there that we will not cross, but certainly doesn't mean that you can't at some point in the future. And you can just see in that view there that the resource extends to the north uh, underneath the topography as depicted. The area to the southwest, you should be able to see this here shortly, spinning around. And you can see that the, the orange uh, intrusive on the left-hand side there uh, it appears to be somewhat of a flaw to mineralization, but certainly we have not tested that area, and we'll cover that a little bit later in this presentation. Yeah, and I think some of the blue colors that we were seeing are the limestones that will play a role in acid neutralization and the development of the site. Yeah, and that's a great advantage to the project. This is a really interesting slide. 
You can see the north zone uh, is quite well drilled. Most of that is indicated. But as you move to the south, right where it says five kilometers, that's basically the, the pillar that we call between the two pits. Very small amount of drilling done in there. So one of the historical holes uh, just to the right of the M in kilometer actually finished in plus 1% copper. And then as you move further to the left on the south zone, not that many holes, but got, got some really good holes there and definitely requires additional drilling. And all of that is inferred. And one of the tasks that we have uh, with an upcoming drilling program is to infill that area. The drill holes can be much shorter. We've, we've basically defined the floor to the mineralization there. So we should be able to get quite a few holes done um, and be a very effective spend on money to, to upgrade the resource. This is just a, a view of the project. You're looking at Brazil is to the north, north zone, and then south zone. And, and what I'd like to point out here is some of the copper oxide outcrops as indicated by the arrows that point to the, the geology map there. And way down to the south of this, you can see copper oxide occurrences outside the pit limits. And the copper oxide occurrences, we're not focused on copper oxide, but they do indicate that there's a sulfide, a copper sulfide source further up slope. And within our mine plan, uh, we're being uh, you know, resource responsible in that we're going to separate these oxide blocks and stack them separately on a waste rock storage facility, which pops up in the next couple of slides. So I find this really exciting. It's an untested area, approximately 500 meters by 500 meters quite steeply incised. We might have to draw from previous pads uh, just to save a bit of money, but really exciting. Yeah, I, I agree, Andrew. The, the oxide potential of the project, we haven't exploited in the PEA. We haven't taken any of the possible revenue there. But as we flip over to this PEA mine plan and site layout, it might be appropriate if you show where or what we have done to potentially take advantage of that in the future. Yeah, so the large waste rock storage facility where the arrow is now, that's that's all waste rock, obviously. But the one to the right, that one there, we're going to use that to our advantage in that the, the haul to that to start it is very short and we're saving money, but it's also going to double as an oxide uh, resource storage. So within the, the resource that we report in the PEA, we do break out oxide tonnage and uh, we're going to keep that there. We don't have a plan for an SXCW plant in there yet. But at some point in the future, if, if an operator wanted to take a look at that, they certainly have the ability to pick up that rock again and put it onto an SXCW or leach pad and an SXCW plant. To the right is the tailings basin storage. Fairly standard, trying to keep it in alignment with some of the international norms that are out there now. It's a centerline dam. To the left of the dam face, you can see the process plant. And that black line from the process plant heading northwest is to the primary crusher. And that's actually through tunnel conveyance, which is the most cost-effective way to get it there. And there's a smaller waste rock pile there in orange. That's part of the build-out for that facility. And also doubles as a storage facility for some of the lower grade that we put to a side, uh, put aside for, for startup and uh, focus very much on the higher grade in the North Pit in the first 10 phases. So here we're zooming in on South Zone in particular to show, showing the drill traces in plan with some of the hotter colors really uh, reflecting some of the higher grades intercepted in drilling. What you will notice in the sort of lower third of the, of the image is a trace with some quite hot colors. That was hole S18 that Andrew referenced previously. And you'll observe that there is no drilling uh, south of that. So we see a fair amount of potential in that it, that part of South Zone for further resource and some grade. It is also worth noting that the blue outline, the jagged blue outline in the image is the current ultimate pit outline from the PEA. And the embayment that was just outlined with the cursor is missing resource and just in the area of that embayment are also some surface outcrops of high molly grade relative to much of the rest of the model and we'll be pointing that out in cross section as well shortly but it is worth noting the the drill distribution down in the southwest of the pit 
Andrew, you might want to comment a bit about the area around S18. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a really interesting hole. We uh, intersected some bridges with uh, some pretty nice grading in them. But uh, it's also worth pointing out that those lower four poles there, they were angled to the east-northeast. So you can see where the, the resource and the, the hotter colors sits. So if you drag that resource to the south or west-southwest, there's a lot of unexplored rock in that area. So one of our tasks will be to, to get some rigs probably back out under those pads and, and drill some vertical holes, helping to upgrade the resource classification, but also contemplate getting back onto S18 and perhaps drilling to the true south uh, east there, back down into that, that sort of valley there. Really prospective area. Kudos to our Mexican geologists. That's a long walk down the hill and it's an even longer walk back up the hill, but they've been in there and they found oxide copper outcrops. And, and more importantly, I think really interesting is that this molly slide that you'll see coming up. Typical porphyry, you think that's getting close towards the center of it. Things are being juggled here tectonically, but still great place to go look for additional mineralization. So this is just the North Zone block model slice drill hole. So you can see copper and gold fit together pretty nicely. Silver, it's great to have it. It's a bit interesting to look at that, but, um, and molly. Again, if you rotate this deposit back to where it probably was, that sort of sits right in the center of the deposit, as it probably should. Um, if you take a look at the south zone, the next slide. And then what I draw your attention to here is, again, a look at the molly slide and the really hot colors there. If you go down the hill, you get to the outcrop, which you'll see in the next slide. But it's a really hot molly area. Copper as well looks pretty good there. And uh, silver sitting away to the right-hand side, which you'd probably expect in a typical porphyry in terms of zoning. So just jump to the next one. There's a really nice outcrop, really coarse molly in what is a, a sliver of andesite there. On the left-hand side, you can see more molly. There's molly in a vein. It has copper assays as well. And if you look at the next one, probably the, one of the gaudiest hand samples of, of molly and outcrop I've ever seen. Really coarse grain molly in clots and there's disseminations and in veins on the rest of the outcrop. So it certainly suggests it was towards the center of a porphyry there. Maybe you want to talk about the rhenium osmium age, Ian? Sure. So that's the one of the samples used to date molybdenite and get an estimate of age dating for the Santo Tomas project. And you see the age date there, 72 MA, which is a little older than the originally anticipated age for the project based on prior publications. So that's a little geological, but it's helping us really constrain the ages of mineralization and to come to understand the, the ore body in greater detail from a scientific perspective. So yeah, fantastic sample and we got some good science out of it. And interestingly, and that age is not that much different from Barawachi. So there, there was a lot going on at that particular time. Two big porphyries contemporaneously forming uh, within the district. Mm -hmm. Okay, terrific guys. Uh, great discussion of project Pretty geology cool. and, and where some potential to probability of expansion exists for an upcoming drill program, as well as some resource, the oxide resource in particular, that is currently not on the table in our economic assessment and that may in the future lead to, to opportunities at Santa Tomas. Okay, so this, this final slide is depicting some of the pit phasing that we've developed in PEA number two. And it's, it's really critical for us because what we're doing is exploiting much higher copper grades through years one to seven. And you can see North Zone, you can see blob number one, then two, three, four, five through to 10, exploiting the North Zone, getting higher grades into the mill, which absolutely improves the economics over and above what it was before. Previously, we had four phases. Here we have... 20 phases in all when you consider the south zone. Perhaps things will change if we have some joy down there in the southwest corner of the south zone, but that would be a nice problem to have. But as it stands right now, it's a really nice mine plan. We're using smaller trucks to start with, then bringing in a much larger fleet, 793s, and things run a, a lot smoother in terms of keeping the grade up years one through seven, which is critical. And I think it's really. fair to say it's enabling us to delay uh, the expansion capitalization, giving us a far more realistic mine yeah. plan when viewed holistically. 
So I think this was a good piece of work, the scaling of equipment and, and the capitalization of the project all make a very good sense now. Yeah, and I'll add that the, the PEA2 takes the project above a number of very important thresholds, whether it's an internal rate of return at a given copper price or a net present value or ratio of NPV to CapEx, for instance. I think some of the changes between the first and the second PEA may look subtle, but they're not. They're very important, and they put the project ahead of a number of peer projects and into the realm of, of what we think is going to be a very attractive economic proposition once M&A in the sector turns to greenfield projects like Santa Tomas and that relatively small group of, of peers, large independently owned economic copper assets. Good job team on, on PEA2 and thank you and thanks Andrew for the talk today to, to explain some of what's to come at Santa Tomas, further explaining the PEA and where we got the improvements as well as some as yet unrealized economic potential within the existing data package. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And thanks, thanks to those who have watched the video through. Yes. See you in part three.